What is that? Well, that's not very telling, is it? Oh, but this is really familiar. Maybe we need our Bible passage to help us figure this out this week. Our passage today comes from Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, if you guessed that I was here in front of the altar in our sanctuary, you are exactly right. Give yourself a round of applause or a pat on the back. Nice job. What gave it away, I wonder? Are you wondering what this has to do with the Bible story that we read from Genesis chapter 12? It's a good question too, but I think that it will become clear when we talk a little bit about the background of that story and where it goes in the next couple chapters in Genesis. So in that chapter, chapter 12 of Genesis, um, all the stuff with Adam and Eve has happened. All the stuff with Noah and his family has happened. All the stuff with the Tower of Babel has happened. And it looks like all of God's plans are, uh, well, they're hitting some rough patches. And all of a sudden, at the beginning of chapter 12, it opens with God talking to somebody new, talking to this guy named Abram. And in this chapter, God comes to Abram and he doesn't say, hey, would you like to work with me? And he doesn't say, I've noticed you're a really good guy. I've got a special job for you. Uh, none of those kind of things. God just appears and declares to Abraham, and that's at the time he's Abram, uh, appears to Abram and says, I'm going to make a promise to you. I'm going to make a commitment to you. And we have a special word for that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament called a covenant. And a covenant is like a promise, but more. It's a, it's a promise that involves all the parts of who you are. And it's a promise that helps you um, trust the person you are in relationship with. So um, it used to be back in those days that um, people that were making uh, legal agreements would make a covenant with each other. And there was some specific language and some things that people did to make that covenant come to pass. And so sometimes in our Bible, we see some of those same patterns showing up when God makes a covenant with people. So this story is the beginning of one of those stories. This is the story of God making a covenant with Abram. And God, usually when you have a covenant, when two people are making an agreement, they would have some terms like, this is what I expect from you. This is what I will deliver for you. But in this promise that God makes Abram, Abram has one job. And Abram's one job is to go. God, it's like the word for walk. Like God just says, walk, get going, and doesn't tell Abram where he's going or how long it's going to take to get there. Um, doesn't draw out all the details of the plan, which I would want to have if I was leaving my home. Instead, God gives him a promise after he gives them that one piece of direction. And the promise is this. I will make for you, I'll, I will make you into a great nation. I'm going to give you land to live on. And through your family, all the families in the world will be blessed. So there's three parts to it. It's called the threefold covenant with Abraham. And so God says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. In other words, I'm going to give you children. And from their children and their children and their children and their children, we're going to grow a whole new nation of people that I will work through. And those people will have a land to live in that I give to them. And 
we are going to use all of them to bless the families of the world. So God wasn't just concerned with Abram and his family. God is concerned with all the families in the world. God wants all the families in the world to be blessed through Abram. So this is God's new plan. Like, what? let's try a new thing here, maybe, is what God was saying. doesn't say that, but I, I wonder if that's what God was thinking. Anyway, so God makes this covenant with Abram. Now, back in the day of Abram, there was a really interesting practice that people would do when they were making a covenant with another person. It's kind of gross, so uh, don't get disgusted. Well, get disgusted, but uh, don't let it, don't let it uh, upset you too much. So what they would do, because at the time um, it was common for um, animals to be sacrificed, that means killed in order to create a connection. So it wasn't just um, killed for its own sake. It was killed on, um, in order to make a connection with someone else. And so when that would happen, when an agreement between two people was happening, they would sacrifice an animal, they would kill an animal, and they would cut the animal into two parts. And both of the people that were involved in the agreement would walk through the parts. I know, pretty weird, right? Like, but the idea is like, this is a really serious thing that we are um, going to do together, and it's so serious we're, we're, um, we're sealing it with a sacrifice. Really big deal. And then they would do this interesting next thing. They would prepare the sacrifice for a great meal, a great covenant meal to, to kind of, this is like the seal of approval, the final act of saying, this is what we're going to do together. So it's interesting in the 12th chapter, uh, when God is making this covenant with Abram, this doesn't happen. But if you turn over to chapter 17, then you will see this covenant ritual that used to happen in the land around where Abram lived, where there was an agreement sealed on a sacrifice. So in chapter 17, you see an animal is sacrificed. And you don't see God's body because God's real funny about us seeing God's body. And so... Um, they don't see God's body, but instead a torch and a smoking pot go through the halves of the animal, and Abraham goes through those halves too. And it's a sign that they are making a commitment to each other. So oftentimes those sacrifices were made on an altar. So they had a large table, and it was usually in Old Testament times made of stone, um, and they would use that as the table on which they sacrificed the animal that was being given. So it's not uncommon when you're reading through the Old Testament that you'll see one of our heroes or heroines, um, whenever they have a close encounter with God, they will build an altar and make a sacrifice as a recognition that this is a moment that they came very close to God, that that covenant that God has made with God's people is real and evident in that moment. And so that became a common practice. And eventually, as the temple was built in Jerusalem, they built a big altar, and that was a part of their, relig their regular religious practice. It wasn't just spontaneous when you met God and something happened, but sometimes it was um, after the birth of a child, or if you needed to ask forgiveness. There was a whole rich set of rituals around how to make sacrifices in the temple in order to have that close meeting with God and celebrate that connection that comes through God's covenant with us. And so, kind of interesting, right? And eventually, when we move into the New Testament, that altar then takes on new significance because one of the things that we talk about is about how Jesus gave his whole life, even unto death, for us to have that connection with God. So we have some of that language when we share in communion, right? And so you'll notice that here on this altar, we have some of the words that we associated with communion. Remember when we talked about that in the fall? Do this in remembrance of me. So some of those words that Jesus used with his disciples way back when. And you'll notice right above the altar, um, if you went straight up, if you could look up above my head, is the big cross here in the sanctuary. So it's this acknowledgement that this is now 
the way that we as Christians understand this altar to function. We no longer bring animals for sacrifice, right? That's not how we, we don't do that in worship on any given Sunday. But instead, we understand this differently. We understand that Jesus has become our atoning sacrifice, the sacrifice that connects us to God. And so the altar takes on that significance. It's that meeting place, that place where the distance between God and people comes really close. Now, it used to be when people designed big churches like this that they would have lots of railings in front of the altar to keep your average person kind of separate from the altar. But here in, in, in modern churches, there's this understanding that the life and death and resurrection of Jesus pulled apart all those separations. So a lot of our architecture, a lot of the ways our buildings are made now is so that there is a direct line. You can walk right up to the altar and it's not against the rules and it's totally okay and nothing bad's going to happen. And so there's this access or ability to come up and see and touch and pray at the altar that is a part of how our church is made that just reminds us that there is nothing that separates us from Christ's love or God's love and the altar becomes one of the symbols with which we understand how big and wild and amazing that love is. So, I want you to be thinking this week about covenants, those special kind of promises that connect people together. And um, we have some of those promises in our own life, and maybe you can think of an example of that. But also, Think about those times in the Bible stories that you know where God has come close to people and people have come close to God in those special promise relationships when we make promises to God and God makes promises to us. And one of the gifts of these covenants is that it helps us understand who God's heart is. It helps us understand that we can trust God to keep God's promises forever. And that's just the nature of a covenant, which is pretty cool. So. I'm glad we don't sacrifice animals anymore. That would make me kind of sad. But helping me understand that practice helps me understand why we have an altar in our church now and what it's supposed to remind me of and how it is connected to the story of Abram and lots of his um, family after him. So I hope that was a fun thing to learn about today. And um, I would love for you to talk about some of the questions about um, Abram and about covenants with your family. Let's talk about that a little bit more and see how that connects to your everyday life. All right, friends, who knows the law turn up next week. We'll see you later. Bye.